Hi, good morning. Oh! <laughs> Today our theme is reality. I heard Jamie talking. Come on in. <laughs> Thank you, Johannes. Uh, yeah, so this is going to be a little bit of fun. Uh, I've got this topic here about, uh, about reality, and really what I thought is I'll talk for maybe about 20 minutes about my kind of experiences in playing around with reality and uh, how we perceive it, how we tend to shape it, how we tend not to think about it so much and mostly how we need each other to create reality in that sense. Uh, so this question of how much of reality is just something we made up. And um, I mean, I'm not gonna talk about whether or not the chair is a material real object. It's clearly there, uh, I think, <laughs> so far. <laughs> I mean, one should be vigorous and ask questions anyway, but you know, I'm pretty sure that that's there. But more in the t sense of like, how do we create the society that we live in and how do we create the, the decisions and the, uh, the norms that we have? And how do we know collectively what's good and what's bad? Or what we want and what we don't want? And uh, if somebody needs you know, a good example of us being, you know, for instance, fickle about uh, what we think is good and what we think is bad, I think all you need to do is look at fashion. Because if you think that you have your own taste in fashion, uh, I have news for you. You have other people's taste in fashion. <laughs> You wear what you wear in order to signal to other people who you are and what your values are and what you think is interesting and what you think things should be like or look like. Uh, and uh, all of that, or you know, who should sleep with you, for instance. That's also another big factor when you're choosing clothing. But if, you know, just think about what you were wearing five, 10 years ago. You thought it was great. <laughs> and it was great. That's the thing, it really was fantastic clothing. You looked fabulous, you would not wear that now. <laughs> the clothes have not changed, but reality has. Our perception of what is cool and what is not cool has changed and we go along with it. And another qu big question I have about reality when playing with it, when deciding that, okay, I can be somebody else, I can, uh, I can try to change myself, uh, is the question of authenticity. I just did a Google image search for authenticity and found all this fabulous stuff. Like, uh, authenticity requires vulnerability, transparency, and integrity. I have no idea what that means. Uh, there's a picture of Gandhi, fantastic. It must be, must be good. <laughs> Keep it real, why not? Uh, be authentic, oh, geez, geez, geez. They're trying to kind of you know, push everything on us. A lot of design agencies had these lovely kind of like long texts about what authenticity is. Uh, and there's, interestingly too, there's an awful lot of pictures, if you look up Google searches, image searches for authenticity, you find a lot of stuff like this, where there's a whole bunch of gray things, and then one colorful thing sticking out from the crowd. Which is a bit weird, it's sort of this idea of be true to yourself, ignore what everybody else says, just go with your own, your own thing. And we value this idea of being true to yourself. We, we value this idea of not being uh, created by other people, but being created by yourself, or being your own true idea. But I don't really think that we think about this all that hard, uh, actually. And I think that this is sort of just a value that we, it's an abstract value that we like, uh, but we don't really know how to put it into practice. We just kind of have it up, up there as a lofty ideal. I also, um, I do stand-up comedy. Uh, I do uh, theater, I've done uh, a lot of performance art, um, and I've done also a lot of uh, live action role playing. So a lot of kind of my history of playing around with reality and possibilities comes from this sort of performance side or in the artistic world. Um, and here's an interesting example of like how we create authenticity or how we create uh, value out of something collectively. Um, this, I mean, I'm sure everybody knows who this is by. This is a Banksy. Um, this was created for the Queen's Jubilee. Which Jubilee was it in 2012? It was the one that was in 2012. Uh, it's known as, uh, as the slave labor mural. And uh, it, was on, it was on a high street shop somewhere. 
And then what happened was that uh, this is an illegal work of art. And actually, technically, it's not a work of art. I mean, it's graffiti. It's garbage. It's, it's not supposed to be there. It's dirty. The council has to clean it up. Um, but because it's a Banksy, somebody else decided, no, this is really valuable. We need to protect it. So they came in and put this plexi thing all around it. And then what happened, which was really even weirder, was that it got stolen. <laughs> As in, and this happens with Banksy's, that the actual, the whole chunk of wall gets removed. And there was a big brouhaha because uh, it's, it showed up in oct uh, for auction in Miami. And the auction house in Miami insisted that, no, this is completely above board. And we were dealing with a reputable dealer here. And the council, from where this was taken, said, no, 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 this was, there was nothing like that. Uh, this was completely stolen. So eventually, you know, the whole thing kind of blew over, and that Miami just went, okay, fine, you can have it back. It got shipped back to London, where it went on auction again, <laughs> even though it was apparently stolen in the first place. And then, uh, funnily enough, that's where it got stolen from. And then we have a protest work of art next to it. And another little rat saying, why? <laughs> and of course, these rats are a signature Banksy piece. So somebody protected the rat. <laughs> it turns out that is not a Banksy. But I think it's just as good right now. So, I mean, that's sort of an interesting idea of like why, why, uh, why we kind of collectively agree that something is valuable. The only reason why that piece of wall is worth stealing is because we have a collective agreement that that piece of wall is worth stealing. And that doesn't mean that you said yes either, individually. Nobody actually had to go and vote and say, yes, that's a valuable piece of wall. That's the weirdest thing about collectively created reality is that no individual has to say yes or no to it. It just, you don't know where it comes from. It feels like it's just this force that's put upon you by nobody in particular and by everybody in general. And that's kind of how we roll. I played around a little bit with the idea of, um, uh, of how people perceive you and how people treat you. And uh, one of the uh, performance I did uh, a couple of years back uh, called The Uncanny Finn uh, dealt with this because I'm, I'm half Finnish, but I don't speak Finnish very well. And I sort of look Finnish, and I sort of don't sound Finnish. And I'm basically in the position where I'm an immigrant, but I'm not a real immigrant, whatever that means. And, uh, and, and that I'm a Finn, but I'm not a real Finn whatever that means. So somehow I lack this authenticity that is required uh, of me collectively. Uh, and so I wanted to kind of problematize that. And so I thought maybe it's the problem is that I just don't look Finnish enough. So I thought I would try to do a performance where I make myself look more Finnish. <laughs> I shaved off my eyebrows and um, <laughs> it's amazing uh, how much you miss them. <laughs> I uh, had these uh, blue contacts and uh, blonde hair, and uh, I, I did actually, people kind of, I did get treated a little bit differently, not just because it looked weird, like people wouldn't, people didn't notice the contacts from, uh, from, from a distance at all, they sort of just noticed the blue tint, and I did actually get people really surprised, they, they, they really treated me a little bit more uh, obviously Finnish. It was a bit strange. Also, I look exactly like my mother. <laughs> or, you know, David Bowie's failed android. <laughs> Friend of mine, uh, who is also a designer of live-action role-playing games, uh, has this really nice uh, quotation say, there's a lot to learn from being someone else. And this is a hobby that I do. I'm not going to talk about this live-action role-play. You didn't know you were going to come here and hear about LARP, but you are. <laughs> Uh, and of course, when people talk about LARPing, often uh, the thing that it has been in the media for the last like 20 years has been Dungeons and Dragons and Orcs in the Forest and pff, yes, and spell, spell boots away, running, running fast kind of thing. That's fun as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure it's fun. I don't do it. I do kind of the art LARPs where we torture each other. 
and, um, or we try to build uh, a different kind of society with slight differences to what we have in our usual reality, and then we kind of test drive for a weekend, what is it like if we live under these particular social rules? There's all kinds of different games uh, where people have uh, played with um, different economic structures, uh, different gender structures, uh, uh, linguistic problems. They've also done things like mapped social problems from other countries onto, uh, onto the society that we have here. And I'll give you some examples of this. Now, this is a little bit more traditional. This is, the, this is called the Monitor Celestra. Has anybody seen Battlestar Galactica? Yeah, OK. So this was basically a weekend game uh, set in the Battlestar Galactica universe. And it was run in a decommissioned warship in Sweden. So they actually had the boat and oh, the tiny corridors and everything. And, and uh, the costumes were all made so that the players got to, got to have them on site when they got there. And they spent the weekend basically pretending to be in a spaceship uh, with uh, programmed events that occurred. And you know, in the end, they all get blown up by the Cylons or something like that. And, they, and uh, you know, people have a terrible time, and then they cry. That's sort of, uh, sort of what they were. This is a more kind of traditional. Uh, fantasy uh, kind, kind of game, or what they've done is they've taken uh, a fictional setting that many people know, and they've allowed people to live in that fictional setting in order to feel what it is like to be in there. That's one thing. This was one that I attended that is, I mean, I'm almost 40 years old and I went to this. Uh, this was a Harry Potter LARP <laughs> in, in Poland, and it was amazing. <laughs> it was completely, completely amazing. Uh, there's some of my, uh, people I know in, in Denmark and Poland, they got together, they rented a castle, because why not? <laughs> and there was something like 100, 120 people uh, there for a weekend, pretending to be in a college of wizardry. So it was set like in a college after Harry Potter, and I was playing a professor. This is a little bit, um, yeah. We were having lots of fun. We, you know, sit around and have, have teachers' dinners and stuff like that. We drank a lot of port. We complained about the students. The students complained about monsters in the basement of the castle. We made them go fight the monsters. They came back. They were happy. Uh, there was an awful lot of that kind of stuff going on. And the thing is that I didn't expect this to be something that I was going to get something out of in terms of uh, a social idea. I thought that I was basically going to go to this game and do a bit of wand waving and have it be a little bit of fun, and that's it. But there are a couple things that are really interesting about being in a magical universe. One is that it doesn't matter how big you are if you get in a fight, because nobody uses physical force ever. People only use magic. And this actually changed the way that gender relations were. And that's a really, really interesting way to have a society, uh, you wouldn't think that Harry Potter is a gender equal universe necessarily, like not on purpose. But because your physical size doesn't matter, it changes how the dynamics were between male players and female players. Anybody could get into an altercation with anybody. It was about your magic. It's kind of interesting. Also, it was really fun just to be a magical professor for. <laughs> for a weekend. I, I, and it, it's what we do with these games, too, is that we're making, uh, when they're done like this, they're in a 360 degree environment. So it's, with, that's how uh, we talk about them. That it means that everything around you that you see is, looks like it's in game. So you feel like you're in that environment the whole time. And being in that environment for enough time makes you start to think a little differently. I remember distinctly at one point, one of my favorite bits was just, I was walking from one end of the castle to the other. I was taking a different route. I didn't see anybody. I was alone in this castle. I had my wand in my hand, and I was thinking all these thoughts about what I had to do. And all of a sudden, I realized, I, I really think I'm a magical professor now. <laughs> I have truly bought into the idea that this is my life now. I, I, I do this now. This is my job. And, it, when you have these in immersive environments, even for a short while, it can fool you into thinking that reality 
uh, is a little bit different. But that just tells me that we don't need much to change. If our environment is consistent, if the feedback we get from our environment is consistent, we can change very quickly. You can also experience things in these games that you perhaps never ever want to experience in real life. This is a game called Halat Hisar Piiritustila, uh, which is a Finnish game made by Johanna Pettersson and, uh, and uh, Kaisa Gangas and a number of other uh, people. And what they did is they took the Palestinian um, uh, occupation situation and they created a fictional story where instead of Palestine being the state that is occupied and oppressed, uh, it is Finland that is occupied and oppressed by a, uh, a non-existent other culture. So this was set at a university, uh, and the universe, there was an incident at the university, and the whole place goes into lockdown. Uh, there are armed soldiers everywhere. We had airsoft players. I won't spoil it, don't worry. You're going to play it. Yes, I won't, I, there's an incident, but I won't spoil it. There are airsoft players playing the... <laughs> it's going to be played again this summer, and it's a fantastic game. Um, uh, we had a lot, yeah, the airsoft guys were really, really happy to be doing all these kinds of like crowd control or whatever missions. Uh, and the students who were Finnish students, we had a, we had a, a, a collaboration with Finnish uh, players and game masters and Palestinian players and game masters. And the Palestinians who were there, they know how to protest. <laughs> the Finns did not know how to protest. So playing this game was also learning about each other's experience and putting yourself bodily in, in the position of what am I, what are the actions that I'm taking out in this reality? It's not necessarily the same as like reading a book about it or seeing a movie about it. When you have the time to think, I have a choice, I can go to this front line, I can throw this stone, I can shout these words, I can try to help this person, I can try to help that person. When you have these choices to be made and you have this embodied experience, uh, it tends to be a much more rich experience in terms of understanding. Uh, that's another picture from the first run of Halat Hisar. This player was playing a, a journalist uh, and he was uh, being in interrogated. And the, the pictures that come out of these games often look completely immersed, like they could be real world. Uh, they could be exactly, I say real world, they are real world, but they, are, they could be from our reality as well. Another game that I played um, was called Kapo in Denmark, and it was a prison camp, and it was absolutely brutal. Um, it was uh, set, I think we had about 40 hours, 48 hours in a uh, completely abstract, built-up prison camp. It was very, uh, very strange. There were cultures inside the camp. We were all there because we were political prisoners. None of us actually thought we were a political prisoner, but we were there. Uh, and they messed with our sleep schedules. They messed with our food schedules. They, uh, there was constant um, uh, just uh, policing, self-policing of the prisoners by the other prisoners. There were no guards in this prison. It was only the prisoners um, uh, punishing each other for breaking the rules. Because if anybody broke the rules, the system wouldn't give us food or something, something bad would happen. We were convinced that something bad would happen if we broke the rules, so everybody was policing each other. It was incredibly anxiety-inducing. I actually had anxiety for a few days after the game, and many people uh, had very, you know, very heavy experiences here. This is not for me to say that I understand what it's like to be in a prison camp at all, but I have some empathy with the processes that happen in the human mind when you're in that kind of situation. That's the kind of thing you can gain, gain from this game. And 60, 80, perfectly nice people played this game. And they also learned that they can be really cruel and really mean if they're given the right environment and the right alibi to do it. This was the game that uh, changed me the most. This is, from, uh, this is from Just a Little Lovin', which is a game about the AIDS crisis in New York City in the 80s. And um, we played a weekend uh, that we were in, uh, in somewhere in New York State at a 4th of July party, 1982, 83, 84. And the characters, most of the characters are from the gay community. 
and some of them are from other from the straight community as well. So there's some there's some uh, some conversation, some dialogue. And in the years that we play, every day is a different year. And as the years go on, people die. Characters die. Your friends die. Uh, people get sick. People don't understand why they're getting sick. People are trying to keep on with their relationships. People are trying to self-destruct because they can't go on anymore. People are trying to uh, save other people. People are, are, are trying anything, anything to cope with this situation. And this wasn't, again, I don't know what it was like to be in New York in the 80s during the AIDS crisis, but I have a bit better empathy with the idea of, of what it might have been like. And one kind of absolutely strange thing happened was that about a week after we finished playing this game, uh, marriage was legalized in New York City, in New York State. Gay marriage was legalized, and, and the, uh, or it was the ratification of it, so people were actually starting to get, to get, um, to get married. And when I saw the pictures of people coming out uh, of the courtroom, it wasn't the 20-year-olds and the 30-year-olds that really kind of caught my eye. It was the ones who were 60 or even 70, uh, who, or who had been together maybe for 25, 30 years since the 80s and they were still together, and they had been through this. They had been through the actual thing that I'd been through, and I just, uh, I had this in incredible connection all of a sudden with people that I wouldn't have had this empathic connection with before. Also, this was an interesting game because uh, when I played it, I was a girl, and uh, I was playing a character who was male. And because I played uh, this male character, um, I had this, this kind of experience during this game that uh, I really liked being male in that environment. I really liked being seen as male. I really liked being understood as male. Uh, I liked it so much that uh, it eventually led to my gender transition. And I wouldn't say that that's the first, you know, the very first inkling of it, but that was probably, that game was probably the moment when I realized that actually I think my life will improve if I do this. Because I had a chance to test drive it. I had a chance to kind of check a different kind of reality. And it did require everybody around me agreeing that this was an okay reality, because everybody around me in the game said, yes, you're a dude. And when I got that from everybody else, I thought, yeah, actually, I think I can handle that. <clears throat> I've talked a little bit about that. I just want a, a couple of design elements that are kind of interesting in the way f many of us are familiar with film or stage or books as a, as a way of, or TV, as a way of getting a story. And uh, here are some of like the kind of easy design elements that tend to make a difference. One is that LARP, you tend to be immersed in it a lot longer. You have time to get bored. You have time to just, you know, kind of live as this person, as opposed to get all the greatest hits of what happens. I mean, you watch Game of Thrones, you don't see what they are doing when they're bored, because nobody's ever bored because they're always fighting or whatever. It's always exciting in Game of Thrones, but life is not always exciting. So these are kind of more, uh, more lifelike in that sense. Also, the story is written in order to make you feel something. And a LARP, the story is a, like a blueprint. And you are the one who has to negotiate the scenes and the, and, and the situations. You co-create it. We have a story that's cohesive. One person, a director, a writer, makes the story, usually, in our reality. But in these games, everybody has their own separate story, and you will never get the whole story. That's just how it is. You can't, like you cannot, I could not write down the story of everybody in this room, even just how you're perceiving this talk right now. There's as many narratives as there are individuals, and you're just <coughs> never going to be able to capture them all. That's how it is. You have a higher participation rate, a higher engagement, and instead of how well people perform, it's more about how interesting does it feel to be there. Often people look at LARPs and they're like, yeah, that's really bad acting. It is bad acting. <laughs> Don't worry about that. It's really bad acting. But people probably feel like they're very interested to be there. And that's more important. And like I say, this embodied experience allows you to, uh, it allows you to kind of, what's the word? 
uh, you have the time to make more choices and make more, uh, have more things actually come to you that are lifelike and, and, uh, and more, like, more like how you would actually live in this environment as opposed to the greatest hits of how you would live in this environment. There's another picture from Halit Hisar, somebody who's never been to any kind of military, uh, military enforced protest or whatever. All of them having this un un different kind of experience. There's somebody from Just a Little Lovin' just uh, having a little sit by the fire. He was there for maybe 45 minutes just thinking about his friends. And there would be another one from Just a Little Lovin'. And of course, we cry, our, we cry our brains out in these games. Usually, the Nordic LARP tradition is all about like, it was a great time. I cried all the time. I was like, it was horrible. I got tortured. It was great. <laughs> and what I like the idea that nobody's really picked up on this um, because it takes a lot of money and it takes, and it's a very kind of weird sort of package to do. But if you wanted to change the world, you could very easily start with 100 people and have them play out your world. And the, way, the reason that that is an interesting idea is because you will get many, many more ideas than just yours. You, will, you can create the world, you can let people run it, you can say, what if, we had, uh, what if we had an economy where we had absolutely no money at all and it was all a sharing economy? Then you have people live for that in a weekend and see what they do, what they, what they develop, what they try to do, how they try to gain an advantage or how they try to collaborate. And you get to observe how humans actually behave in these kinds of situations. Yeah, as I said, I could test drive another life and I liked it. And of course, if I come for the final, uh, just at the end, if I come back to reality, uh, I'm also aware that my kind of reality of, of, uh, of my gender expression, for instance, is also now something that is, um, is it authentic? I, I, don't, I don't really know. I like this photograph because I posed as a boxer because this is like such a masculine pose to have. Is that me? Is that an image of me that I want to have? Is that, you know, who am I, who am I making that for? What kind of reality am I perpetuating by participating in that image? And what kind of things do I want to receive as a reward for conforming to the reality in that image? And I'm kind of constantly aware that what I'm doing is at once completely authentic and at the same time uh, like a parody, uh, a parody of gender as well, of masculinity. Uh, I'm trying too hard, a lot. <laughs> and at the same time, uh, I'm very comfortable in it, and I feel very, I feel very at ease. So, yeah, these are the, basically my thoughts on, uh, on reality, on it being socially agreed upon, socially constructed, uh, by everybody, for everybody, but with nobody actually, you know, doing anything kind of conscious to do it. And uh, I suppose that's it. If you have questions about anything at all, I'd be happy to answer. <laughs> <laughs>